Good morning, everybody. Thank you to James and Marilyn for that beautiful worship. What a great thing that we can get together this morning and still do church and still be together. Uh, James and Marilyn, that was just beautiful. Thank you so much. I just felt like the presence of the Lord was here and I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, we are all staying safe in our own homes. Let's start with live reading. Just hang on, Anton isn't sure that I'm on. Can somebody send a note if I am? I'm on. Good. Thank you. Good. We'll keep going. And uh, if I disappear at some point, let me know. I hope you're all staying safe and looking after yourselves. We want to again emphasize the need to stay home to social distance, to be very, very careful. Uh, we are so grateful to our government, we're so grateful to our uh, medical professionals for looking after us and for giving us such great advice. So stay home, be safe. I've said it all week to you on various posts, God is bigger than COVID-19. But we need to do our part to look after our homes and our community. And so thank you everybody who's doing your part. It's kind of funny this morning, I had a friend who said she was going to watch three th different services in three different cities this morning, all from the comfort of her own living room. And I'm sure a lot of us are doing it. I had the joy of watching my big brother uh, lead worship and preach a little bit in Ontario this morning. So it was, it was great fun. But in these times, it's important that we look to the Lord, that we stay together, and that we stay wise. So let me pray, and we're going to get into the Word together. Father, I just thank you that this is a wonderful day that we can celebrate you. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we determine to rejoice and be glad in it. We realize, Lord Jesus, the things that are happening around our world. And again this morning, in the name of Jesus, we speak to this coronavirus to cease and desist. Lord, we pray protection on every single person represented in this in this broadcast, on every person on this planet. We cover this planet. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will move in unprecedented ways and that many people will come to you and come to know you and find their comfort and their strength in you, Lord Jesus. And now we ask as we go into your word that you will bless and anoint and that you will help us to see still that you are God over all. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a little different preaching this morning. Uh, you're looking at me, I'm looking at my kitchen. So, you know, I'm hoping the kitchen is going to receive the word that I give to it because that's the way it's going in my, <laughs> in my household. So, welcome. And I think you can see our birds behind us. I'm praying that they receive the word as well this morning. Easter is almost here. It's unbelievable. And uh, you know what happens? It, like Christmas, we know it's coming every year. Uh, every Christmas, I start thinking about it in June. I think every mother and grandmother does. And I start saying to Anton, whoa, Christmas is only six months away. But, you know, I gotta get my head in that space. And I start thinking about Easter two, three months beforehand. Okay, Easter is coming. But suddenly, it's upon us. And, and this year, especially with everything that's going on, I feel like, huh, Easter is three weeks from today and suddenly it's upon us. But you know we have all this time to get ready for it. But as we're looking to Easter, I'm going to start a series this morning that will take us through to Easter Sunday entitled At a Crossroads. It's a little bit of a play on, on uh, Easter and on the cross. We're making our way towards the cross Easter Sunday, Easter Friday, and we're on the road. We're on a journey together. And so I'm going to start a series called At a Crossroads. Because I don't have slides behind me, you can pretend I have slides behind me, but <laughs> I don't. I'm going to get you to grab your, your phone, your iPads, grab your Bible, whatever it is to keep up with me. But this morning, we're going to talk about the anointing of a king. We're going to look at uh, the Easter story through the eyes of the Apostle John. We're going to go to the book of John this morning. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have accounts of Easter, and it's interesting to take those accounts, read them as you get yourself towards Easter, take those accounts, they all put in a little bit of a different flavor, but I chose this time to go through the book of John. John sometimes gives us extra bits of the story that maybe Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't, and I want to see it through his eyes. The anointing of a king, we're starting our journey, we're on the road towards Easter. We're on the road towards Good Friday and looking at the cross. We're on the road towards Easter Sunday and celebrating our resurrected Savior. But this morning we're going to talk about the anointing of a king. Let me set the context for this morning. 
In John chapter 11, the plot to kill Jesus by the religious leaders began in earnest. The chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting together right after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. Now Jesus is a central figure. People are flocking to him and the chief priests and the Pharisees are getting concerned about this because in essence, they were losing control. Now it was more about losing personal control. It was bigger than that. If you recall, the Jews were under Roman rule at this time. And they allowed the Israelites and the, the, the Romans allowed the Jews to keep their religion, to keep their faith, as long as they didn't cause trouble. And along comes this guy, Jesus, who begins to heal people, who has compassion, who begins to teach people like he's, they've never heard before. And the chief priests and the Pharisees are getting concerned. This guy, Jesus, who basically by his actions is saying to people, hey, I'm God, you need to listen to me. And as people flocking to him is presenting a real threat. There could be a riot, there could be mobs, there could be problems. And so in John chapter 11, they have a meeting and they get together and they're discussing it. And Caiaphas was the high priest that year and he spoke up to the rest of them in this meeting of the priests, the chief priests and the Pharisees. He says, you know nothing at all. I don't know how staff or how council would respond to me if I said, hey, you guys know nothing at all, but this is what Caiaphas is. He said, you do not realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to kill Jesus. They plotted to take his life. There was a difference between the religious leaders and Jesus. There was a difference between their attitude and their actions and that of Jesus. The religious leaders we know held themselves aloof. They made rules, they made regulations. I don't know if I've told you guys this story, but there's, there was a sect of Pharisees in that time and they were known as the bloody Pharisees. They wouldn't look at women, they wouldn't look down, they were very aloof. And so, because if you go out in the marketplace and you just go out of your front door, there's gonna be people there, there's gonna be women there, they would wander around with their eyes closed or their eyes shut or not looking and they were constantly bashing into brick walls and doors and signposts and often this particular group of Pharisees had literally bloody faces. They were aloof. But Jesus comes along and begins to operate in compassion. I think of the story of the, women with, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. If I can touch the hem of his garment, and Jesus says, who touched me? And in compassion, he healed her. I think of the story of the friends who had the crippled man, and, and they took him on his bed, so to speak, on his mat, went and took the ceiling out of somebody's living room and lowered him down to where Jesus was. Let me just say something right out front. Don't any of you ever bring somebody to our house and take our roof apart, okay? We're not into that. But back then, that's what they did. And Jesus, in compassion, healed him. I, I think about the woman who was following her son's funeral procession. And, and, and this is her only son, and he's died, and she has no way of income. She's lost. She's desperate. Jesus walks along and says to her, I'm on your team. And he touches her son and says, come on, up you get. And he raises him from the dead. These people know that Jesus has compassion. They're following him. And then ultimately, Jesus hears that Lazarus has died. It's an interesting thing because he doesn't go running to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He doesn't charge off to say, oh my goodness, he's died, I gotta go and comfort the sisters. He actually looks at his disciples and says, we'll hang out here for a couple of days. When he does go, he meets Martha, he meets Mary. Mary's weeping and she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. And at that point, the shortest scripture in, Christ, in, in the, the shortest verse in scripture comes out and it just says, Jesus wept. Jesus was full of compassion. And as you know, if you've read your Bible, been in church long enough, he brought Lazarus out of the tomb and back to life. 
So let's pick the story up now in John chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Now that's an interesting thought. You think Jesus knew he was a thief. But here he was, one of the disciples. Jesus was giving him every chance to be transformed. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. You know, <laughs> poor guy. He's sick, he dies, he comes back to life, and before he has a chance to get going, the plot is out to kill him again. The chief police, priests were planning to kill him, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. This morning, I want to look at the anointing of Jesus by Mary as we start our journey towards Easter weekend. Anointing in scripture always signified something big. People stopped when anointing happened. In the Old Testament, there were two classes of anointing. One was anointing of kings and priests, and it signified being set apart. It was holy. The person was being set apart, concentrated. Authority was being placed upon them for something. When a king was anointed, everybody stopped. When a priest was anointed, everybody stopped. It was huge. Anointing was special. The second use of anointing was for everyday life. It signified everything from diplomatic relationships to business uh, contracts to the liberation of slaves. Um, it, it, it marked special places. If you go into Genesis chapter 28, you'll see the story of Jacob, who laid down one night he had a dream, and he saw a staircase running from heaven to earth, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the staircase. At the top of that staircase stood God himself, who in this dream spoke to Jacob. When he woke up in the morning, he took the rock that he had used for a pillow, and he set it up, and he poured oil over it. He anointed that rock that he was resting on, and he called the place Bethel, which means the house of God. So anointing was used for everyday transactions, business transactions. It was used to set apart kings and priests. It carried significance. See, in our culture today, kings and queens don't mean that much to us. Uh, we still have Queen Elizabeth, for instance, in England. As we're part of the Commonwealth, you could still say she's our queen. But we don't operate with the importance of kings and queens like they used to. In the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 10, verse 1, he went to anoint Saul as king over Israel. And it says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you leader or king over his inheritance? When Samuel failed, when Saul failed as a king, Samuel then went looking for David, the shepherd boy. In 1 Samuel 16, 13, he said, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, anointed David, in the presence of his brothers. Now let me just say this, there's nothing special in the oil. Oil is oil is oil. You know, today we hear about, uh, do you use olive oil, do you use virgin olive oil, do you use grapeseed oil, coconut oil, use any kind of oil you want. The reality is oil is oil is oil. It's not the oil. It's not the oil. The oil is a symbol of the blessing and the presence of God. It's not the oil. Listen, I received one healing one day, way back. When I was 30 years old with back issues, my parents anointed me with Crisco oil, and God healed my back. It's not the oil. It's God. 
is the authority of God behind the oil, so to speak. One of the things that I want to point out to you this morning is the significance of the oil. When kings were anointed in the Old Testament, that oil was also coined or also known, known as the oil of gladness in keeping with the celebration. And I want you to keep that thought in your mind, the oil of gladness. So the first thing in setting context for you, the first thing about anointing is this, anointing brings with it an announcement. We're anointing a king, we're anointing a priest, we're anointing somebody to set them apart for service to God. There was a pattern that had to be followed when a king was anointed in Old Testament, New Testament times. Let me give you the pattern. There had to be a, dis a dinner given a distance away from Jerusalem. The anointing of that person had to happen on an ordinary day, not a holiday. The king with the anointing was then appointed king. And after that, the king would then enter Jerusalem as the king. When we go back to the story in John chapter 12, we see that Jesus was anointed by Mary in Bethany. Bethany was about two miles or approximately three kilometers from Jerusalem. We see that the anointing was done six days before the Passover. So she anointed him on just a, an ordinary every day of the week. We see that he was anointed at a dinner given in his honor. We see that by her act, a prophetic announcement was made. And if you read further in John chapter 12, the very next day after Mary had anointed Jesus, he made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. You see, a similar announcement of his kingship had been made by another woman in Luke, Luke chapter 7. Again, a dinner was being held. Jesus was at home of a Pharisee, Simon, who was holding a dinner. And a woman came in it was, uh, who had lived a sinful life. Let's call her a prostitute. And she prophetically anointed Jesus again. She poured expensive oil on him and expensive perfume on him. It was a similar situation. Honor and respect were given to him. So an anointing brings an announcement. These two women, by their anointing of Jesus, brought some announcement. I'm anointing somebody who's special. I, I'm announcing that I believe this person deserves honor and respect. This person is Messiah King in my life. Anointing brings clarity. When Saul was anointed as king, along with that anointing, he received a spirit of understanding. In Psalm 133, the priests are anointed, and it talks about them receiving the blessing of God, the provision of God to do the work they're called to do. Well, the anointing of Jesus in Luke chapter 7, but particularly in John chapter 12, is very clear in what it says. I want you to understand this. Kings and priests receive the anointing of oil over their hands. Psalm 133 talks about the anointing of the oil being poured over the priest's head and it's dripping down its beard. It anoints for wisdom and blessing. But Mary and the woman in Luke chapter 7 didn't anoint Jesus' head. They anointed his feet. It wasn't because his feet stunk. At least I'm going to assume that. It wasn't because they couldn't reach his head. It was because they were signifying the way that his kingship was to be announced. When you anoint somebody's feet in those days, you are actually preparing them and signifying death and burial. Their prophetic announcement was this. This King Jesus will die for every one of us. Do you remember? Caiaphas said, it's better that one man dies for the nation than everybody dies. And Mary anoints him and says, here's the one who's going to die for the Jewish nation. Here's the one who's going to die for all of humanity. 
Professor Ben Acker says something concerning this anointing. He says, herein lies Jesus' unique kingship. He will conquer sin and death and will rule over people through his righteousness. I want you to hear this. In particular, he says, his cross will be his throne. Do you know what? When I read that, my heart just took a leap. The cross of Jesus will be his throne. Somebody say amen. Anton's watching me. Amen. Thank amen, you. sister. It's, Preach it. it's about Preach time. It. <laughs> but it's the most incredible thing. His cross will be his throne. We look at the cross and we consider it a horrid place. And it is. Let me tell you something. The Romans spared no effort and they spared no expense at torturing and killing their enemies. But even with the cross, Jesus took the horror of humanity's sin and he turned it around with the glory of his kingship. The cross became his throne. See, when they lifted him up on the cross, the Romans left an inscription on the top and it said simply this, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The announcement was made. King Jesus is here. It's in the open. Our King has arrived. Hallelujah. The cross is his throne. And then when that happened, everybody came to a cross road. Jesus had said to his disciples in John chapter 12, leave her alone. She's anointing my feet for the burial. Here it was. It was ready for everybody to see. I'm going to die. What are we going to do with it? Would his disciples continue to follow him? Would they walk away? Would they be afraid? Would they have the strength to handle his crucifixion? They were at a crossroads. What are we going to do? Well, we all know they were ter terrified during the arrest and the interrogation. We know Peter was so scared that he denied Jesus three times. We know they followed Jesus outside of the city. We know they were there at his crucifixion. We know that after his death, the disciples, and really probably all of his followers, went behind closed doors for fear of the chief priests. We know that they were terrified. We also know that somehow they understood that Jesus was still Messiah God. When he rose again, we know he reinstated Peter. We know that the disciples came out from behind closed doors and on the day of Pentecost, they were in the temple when the Holy Spirit came. We know that they became bold and world changers. <laughs> Our king was announced through a cross. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Well, it brings us to a crossroads. What does anointing mean for us today? It's nice to know the history. It's nice to know that Jesus was anointed. It's, it, it's good to know that his cross became his throne in that moment. But what does it mean for us today? I asked you to remember a certain phrase, the oil of joy for gladness. Let me tell you what it means for us today. I'm going to take you back to Isaiah 61, and I'm going to read to you verses 1 to 3. Jesus actually quoted these scriptures as recorded in the Gospel of Luke. But let me read what Isaiah said hundreds of years before Jesus arrived. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God. Now listen, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for all those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. There it is again, the oil of gladness, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise for the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. You see, when Jesus came 
And we came to the cross in our own individual lives. And we said, Lord Jesus, we need you to come into our lives. We are sinners, but forgive us and come into our lives. Make us new on the inside. As I say to you often, Jesus said, if you ask me, I'll come and I'll dwell in you. And when he came and he dwells in us today, he brings us the oil of gladness instead of the spirit of mourning. He comforts those of us who are grieving what is happening. He gives us everything that we need. He gives us beauty instead of ashes. If you're watching this morning and you say, Anne, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I have to tell you, I've, I've never ever reached a point where I ask this Jesus to come into my life let me tell you, now is the best time to do it. And it's so simple. Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. And I ask you today to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new on the inside. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Cleanse me, Jesus. I want to live with you and for you. That simple prayer or some form of that prayer. Do you know what? The minute you ask, Jesus comes. And for all of us that have asked Jesus into our life, we can celebrate Easter in the midst of COVID-19. Easter is a time when we remember the death of Jesus. So it is a time of remembering death. But you know what? It's a time of remembering life. And we're going to talk a lot more about Jesus resurrecting from the dead. Our sin was taken to the cross. It was buried there. Listen, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far Jesus has removed our sin from us. By his making the cross his throne, he's given us new life. We are brand new people on the inside because of that cross. Even further back, because of the anointing that started the journey to the cross. Death produced life, and life produces life. Your life right now in Christ Jesus affects everybody that you see. This year, more than any other year, we who are in Christ Jesus need to be bold. We have the oil of joy instead of mourning. We have the spirit of wisdom and understanding from God. And we're called to shine this incredible light of Jesus. How do you do it? A smile, a hello, a heart of prayer, a heart of confidence, a heart of expectancy. Your life produces encouragement in other lives. We're at a crossroad. Life isn't business as usual. Our country is slowly coming to a standstill. Our economy is suffering. A lot of people in isolation are doing isolation alone. Those of us who are at home with maybe spouses and children, we're in isolation, but we're not suffering it like those who are alone, alone. And for some, death and their mortality is really staring them in the face. Where is God in all of this? I'm sure the disciples were asking the same thing. But just as Jesus revealed himself to his disciples after his resurrection, day by day, he reveals himself to us. He reveals himself to us in his word. I encourage you, be in the word every day. He reveals himself to us through worship as James and Marilyn were singing. I'm telling you what, my heart was filling up with the goodness of God and the presence of God. He reveals himself to us as we speak to each other on social media, on our telephones. He reveals himself to us as we're out and social distancing, but maybe waving and smiling at each other. He reveals himself to us in creation. I look out our window this morning and we have clouds in Ladysmith, but man, it's beautiful out there. And he reveals himself to us deep, deep, deep inside. He reveals himself to us because he loved us and because he was anointed and announced as a king. His anointing he freely gives to all of us. Stay safe. Follow the rules. But do
do it with the love and the anointing and the confidence and the oil of joy that Jesus gives. Let me pray for you today. I want to recommend a couple of sites. Right now, media is available for you to get into scripture. The Bible Project is available. This week, we're going to have some open chat rooms to love on each other. Uh, Comox Pentecostal. We're going to organize some open prayer times. We're going to organize some coffee times. So there's lots of stuff going to be going on. But as we are following and walking in obedience to our public health officials and our governments, let's do it in confidence. Jesus, this morning, I pray for everybody watching this uh, live stream. I pray, first of all, Lord Jesus, that they will know right now a sense of your peace, that they will know your confidence, that they will know that you never leave us or forsake us, that they will know in the midst of this coronavirus you are still on the throne and you are still God and Lord of all. I pray that they will know your protection. I pray that they will know your wisdom. And I pray, Lord Jesus, even as you were anointed and prepared to be announced as king, we will know that anointing of peace. We will know that anointing of confidence. We will know that anointing of wisdom and calmness in the midst of uncertain days. Jesus, we love Comox Pentecostal Church. We care. But all of those who love and care aren't even close to your heart and your love and care for us and the entire globe. And so as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we submit to you this morning with confidence and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the peace of God that transcends all understanding, guard and garrison your hearts in Christ Jesus. I love you, church. Have a wonderful week. We'll be in touch. Amen.